Welcome everyone. My name is Megan Duffy and I'm IPCNY's Education and Artist Programs Manager and I want to welcome you to our very first New Prince Artist Talks um, held virtually. We'll be hearing tonight from three artists who are on view in Give Me Space New Prince 2020 Summer, which was juried by Chitra Ganesh. Um, if you haven't already looked at the website, I would encourage you um, after the talks to kind of explore and click through. I'm going to kind of quickly show you a little bit um, of the website so that, you know, maybe you'll be interested to do a little exploring on your own. So this is the exhibition website. As I mentioned, um, Chitra Ganesh was our juror for the show, um, and she was really thoughtful in the way she organized the show. You can listen to a statement from Chitra here, um, as well as that we have the transcript. Um, and then the exhibition itself is organized through five overlapping themes that are kind of a framework for how the show is organized. So as you scroll down, you can look through all of the works together in alphabetical order, or if you click this drop down menu, you can see the different themes. A little bit of text will come up uh, that Chitra wrote explaining kind of what that theme means to her and then see the works that um, are part of that theme. And as I mentioned, they're overlapping. So you'll notice that um, different themes may have um, works appearing multiple times. So I just wanted to kind of go over that first because um, we would really encourage you to look at the full show. To stop that. Um, but tonight we will be hearing from three artists. Um, and I would encourage everyone please to use the question and answer function. So we will be doing a Q&A with each artist after they speak about their work. Um, please, when you're asking a question, um, write which artist it's for because we may not get to every question after the artist has, you know, does their, does their talk and we're going to plan to kind of regroup at the end and answer as many remaining questions as we can. So please include the artist names. Um, and I think that's about all of the explainers that we need to do right now. Um, so I'm going to kind of hand the mic over to Jean-Marc Superville Sovac and we'll be hearing about his work. Okay, am I on? Is this, is this working? <laughs> this is working, yes. Okay, hi, um, my name is Jean-Marc and um, I'm um, really happy to be in um, a, a really um, intelligently thought through um, a show. And I feel like um, I have a lot of people that I don't know, but that I feel like I really should get to know in, uh, in, this, in this show. But um, in the whole sort of COVID situation that we're in, I find that um, everybody's done an amazing job at uh, IPCNY. So um, with that, I'm going to try and work as much information as possible in a short amount of time uh, for uh, uh, explaining a little bit where I'm coming from. Because I have to uh, be honest, I'm not a printmaker. Um, and I, I mean that like very innocently um, because I recognize that it's a, it's a ton of work. But um, I, I hope I can explain the sort of parasitic relationship that I have maybe with uh, printmaking. However, my father, oddly enough, was uh, a, a printmaker uh, for a while. And I conveniently staged this portrait that he did of my sister uh, when she was about six years old, maybe four, with Eeyore. Um, at the bottom, because she lost her ER. For those of you who are familiar with Pooh, um, so so what I'm gonna do is um, share my screen, and I'm just gonna share my whole screen because I'm afraid to screw it up here. Um, whoa, and I'm gonna find uh, the PowerPoint, which is here. I'm gonna share, and then can everybody see what I'm seeing? Yes. Yeah? All right. Cool, let's go. So that's my little intro page. I wanted to describe what I mean by ahistorical landscapes because that's what these, this series is called of, 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 of prints. They are prints. Um, and what I mean by speculative realism. <laughs> Hopefully that'll make sense um, as we go. But um, the two main sort of influences that got me into this question of, of, of this specific work are, are these two figures, both male, both uh, white, 
but um, who used their privilege very differently in the beginning of the 19th and middle of the 19th century in the United States. And the fellow on the left is um, Thomas Cole. Now, Thomas Cole, uh, oddly enough, who was British, um, had uh, an idea. And the idea was that um, the American landscape, for an American landscape painter, um, what makes it American is that it does not require any representation of Rome or some ancient civilization. That landscape paint, painting could be just about that, just about landscape. And because of what he called the, 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 the wilderness, the American picturesque had its own monuments, which was its wilderness. Now it's very coded and very laden with ideas. And so um, um, if I, ooh, Okay, this was so popular that you know many artists picked up the brush and decided to depict this American landscape, Asher Duran being one of good colleague of, of Thomas Cole. But Asher Duran also happened to be a fantastic printmaker and he would often make prints from his paintings. It's not a bad idea financially too. Um, but around this time, this, these prints became so popular that they became almost enterprises. And this fellow, named William Bartlett was one of these enterprising fellows and he came from England with this idea that he was going to make the American picture book, the American picturesque in a picture book of prints. And the prints are pretty formulaic, but they're, they're vi these vistas, you know, these landscapes, the wilderness. He's following Thomas Cole's script, you know, to a T. Um, but then I was curious about who else was um, making and thinking about art in that um, roughly around the same time. And this fellow here, uh, 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 Henry uh, David Thoreau, um, had a different idea of the American landscape. And um, some of it surprised me. And what surprised me was in an essay that he wrote in 1853 called Slavery in Massachusetts. And Thoreau was outraged at the idea that um, something like the Fugitive Slave Act allowed slaveholders to come and pick up their, their property that had the audacity to try and steal their own freedom. Um, but at the same time, those magnificent prints of the Hudson Valley and of American wilderness um, were these. This was being printed too. Um, these anti-slavery with all sorts of information, you know, number of slaves in New York goes from 1920 to 10, from 10,000. Uh, and then in 1830 goes down to 76, boom, abolition of slavery. It's, um, but these, um, these anti-slavery records were also il illustrated. And I find it very interesting that there were these artists who may have seen themselves as abolitionists, I don't know, but they were, they put their craft to the cause. And so the thought occurred to me, what would happen if these two methods of printmaking that had no real chance of mixing with each other at the time, uh, post, his, post historically, ahistorically, could jam together. And so by taking some of those images out and then duplicating them onto the landscapes, I thought like this gives, a, 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 this is what I mean by speculative re realism. What was happening in 1839 in Mount Tom by the Connecticut River? Well, or, or what was happening um, in spring, upstate New York, not, not far from Saratoga Springs, very known for its medicinal waters. Right? The rich, they flocked there. Well, Boston Springs, Saratoga Springs, neighboring towns was the to hometown of Solomon Northup. If anybody saw the movie, 12 Years a Slave, this was what it was the slave narrative that it was based on. And um, there were tons of these slave narratives. Um, um, you know, any, every, 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 they raised funds by having uh, um, 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 a new, you know, newly freedom finding, um, um, uh, slaves um, um, raise money for by giving these talks. Um, so each historical landscape has a figure, like sometimes here is a known figure like John Brown. Well, uh, uh, William Bartlett did a vista of Harper's Ferry in 1839. 
Well, in 1864, there happened to be the, the, the most, the bloodiest attempt at a slave revolt, uh, just, you know, a few years uh, apart. So in, in Harper's Ferry here, I put, I put John Brown. Um, I could go on and on, but um, I'm going to try and wrap up. Um, each, so each print is a print. It's a found print. I became um, a sort of un uh, unintentionally a print collector. And each image is an actual print. It's not digital. And I had to think about that because I thought what made these very unique um, was that each print was, had somehow survived somehow all of these, these years. And, and they're gorgeous. I just want to make sure everyone understands how much I'm in awe of some of the technical um, uh, prowess that's um, um, developed here. Um, but um, through, I'm going to plug um, uh, two very essential uh, groups of people who made this happen, the Fallkill um, Creative Works uh, in Poughkeepsie. If anybody's up at State in Poughkeepsie looking for a print shop, uh, that's where you want to go. They're good people. Emily Hussard, if you're out there, thank you. Um, and this other company called Boxcar Press. And from, from Boxcar Press, I learned that from a digital image, a printing plate can be made through the magic of technology. <laughs> I don't know how it works, really. But um, those prints are, um, are, 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 are unique in the sense that they've, um, they've uh, survived this amount of time. But I, I see myself as sort of like the last sort of edition, <laughs> maybe not the last, but the sort of concurrent edition of this, of this print, but you know, maybe um, um, several, several years apart. So um, I'm going to just uh, shout out the, the Samuel Dorsky Museum, which purchased several of these in the, uh, at New Paltz, at SUNY New Paltz. And um, I've also had the good fortune of being invited to curate a show, um, which is um, going to be some probably a historical mashup um, in September. And that show is called We Wear the Mask by a poem named after a poem named, uh, by a guy named uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Anyway, um, any questions? I have a YouTube channel. <laughs> um, uh, I, 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 think, I think I'm done. I think that's good. I think I want to uh, leave, it, leave it open to folks, or I can show you my YouTube video. You can go see it yourself. <laughs> Um, so now would be a great time if anyone wants to um, oh, I'll, I'll enter questions into the Q&A box um, for Jean-Marc to answer about his work. Um, Are we back? We're on, you don't see my screen anymore? <laughs> <laughs> no, your screen share. <laughs> um, did you, so you, mentioned that now you're a print collector did how did the research for the works start you know it's fascinating because i figured in my head i was like well i can't paint on a thomas cole painting like that's not gonna happen you know but it was very fortuitous that this method of art making that was very democratic if you think it's very democratizing the <laughs> idea that i have my own set of prints you know i don't have to have a thomas cole but i have this you know beautiful object you know um, and oddly enough, the book that had all these texts, these very romantic texts about the woodland and the Indians and, you know, Indians, um, uh, they, the text barely survives. You know, and the guy, the writer, Nathaniel Parker Lewis, I don't, I never heard of him, but, but William Bartlett is obviously very well known, especially in the uh, antique store uh, circles <laughs> like oh you're looking for a Bartlett let, let me show you <laughs> so the 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 prints have survived however the book has not and um, so so yeah so um, uh, I enjoy um, um, I enjoy collecting so did, did you collect the prints um, before you were planning on on making this series or were you planning the series and so you bought the prints? Uh, no, I was planning an idea and the print uh, 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 made itself out to be the appropriate medium in this case. Um, it just happened to be that there was this volume of material that I could work with. Um, mm -hmm. 
that said, I'm not opposed to expanding this whole idea. And if somebody wants to hire me and we do like some, you know, video projections on a Thomas Cole, I'm all for it. <laughs> I'm right. talking to you, Thomas Cole site. <laughs> but yeah. anyway, um, I, I, I'm, I'm just like, I'm just like, that's what I mean. I just sort of latched on to this printmaking. Like I really don't have a history of this, but um, it, it, it certainly lends itself um, very well. Um, here, so Heather Hansen says, were you inspired by any other artists that might combine historical imagery? Oh yeah, for sure, man. Like Carol Walker is just like, you know, after Carol Walker, there was, there was, there was like, uh, there's nothing that you could do that didn't um, represent blackness in a, in a, in a sense in the, in the sort of 19th century sort of gothic, crazy gothic <laughs> way that she represents it. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I owe a lot to ton, tons of artists. I mean, this is not, I'm not pretending this is anything, you know, uh, groundbreaking. Um, what do you think are the social and political ramifications of injecting these additional narratives into well-known print works? Oh, well, I think it's big, a big deal. A lady at the opening came up to me and asked me very seriously if I was trying to create forgeries. And I thought, <laughs> this is fascinating that this thing could surreptitiously like live on a wall and people would be like, hmm. <laughs> what does what is this how did this image of, of 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 slavery suddenly appear in my in my in my uh you know uh bartlett print i i mean i'm not gonna pretend that i don't have a a, a slight pleasure in um the uh um i iconoclastic is kind of uh pushing it but you know the kind of um the sense of uh cheekiness of printing on a print you know, um, I don't know. Um, I, 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 I hope that they certainly have a, a future living somewhere where there's, there creates a lot of ambiguity. I'm okay, I like ambiguity. All right, um, thank you so much, Jean-Marc. Um, so if anybody has more question, questions for Jean-Marc that, you know, maybe we wanna answer at the end, you can still feel free to type those in and ask questions to each of our panelists as we go. Um, but now um, we are going to move forward and speak to Faro Muhammad. Welcome. Am I on? Hi. <laughs> Hi everyone, thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Farah. I was born and raised in Karachi, Pakistan. I moved to the US eight years ago to attend Bennington College. Um, after my undergrad, I worked in New York for three years as a social worker, and I'm now pursuing my MFA at Columbia University. Um, so I'll start off by talking about uh, my print in the show, and then I'll follow up with some um, with some more monotypes, uh, some etchings, and then a screen printing project. Do you do you guys see my screen? Okay, cool. Okay, so this is my print, Give Me Space. It's a monotype, um, as I mentioned. Uh, I made this by referencing photos that I had taken around my childhood home in Karachi, Pakistan during my last visit. So my house from the inside has remained the same, but there's this building across from it that has been in construction since the last nine years. And every time I return, it's a bit taller and it's caving in closer and I was interested in capturing that. So I created this composition by dividing the architecture that I was referencing into shapes. So like, you know, these, these type of shapes like here and here, I sectioned these off onto clear plexiglass um, with tape and then I would roll ink onto the plexiglass. Um, then the blue, the blue part of the scaffolding I painted with, paint, with a paintbrush and then I wanted a little bit more dimension in this wooden part of the scaffolding and in the tarp. So I created sort of a stamp with paper and I uh, put, so I took some paper and I layered uh, pieces of scotch tape onto that, rolled ink, um, painted some of the ink on and then put that on the plexi, put the paper on top and rolled it through the press. And that's how there are some indents in, in, this, in the paper at, uh, during the, like these marks. Um, then, I made this print in a similar way where I sectioned off uh, parts of the plexiglass using tape and rolled ink and uh, painted some ink 
um, some of it on the plexiglass up here. Um, I was interested in making this composition because I came upon this scene in this market where every part of every inch of the space was being utilized. And um, I really liked the pattern that had been created with, with all the action. Um, so this is a print of a place called Hassan Kiev in southeastern Turkey. Um, I did some work here do, during my undergrad. Um, I, I made this print by making a basic sketch onto newsprint. Um, I stuck that under clear plexi, painted parts of it, rolled ink onto other parts of it. Um, with, with monotyping, my favorite part is when um, the, press the pressure of the press collaborates with um, the marks that you paint on to give you these like surprise marks. Um, and then I did some citrus solvent transfers here and played with, I was using images that I had taken around the town and I was playing with the scale here to kind of like represent parts of the story of this space. So um, while I was visiting, uh, there was a lot of concern that this town was uh, going to be flooded by a dam. Um, and I'm, I'm, I guess I'm revisiting this today because earlier this year, this town was um, actually flooded and, and like its residents were displaced. Um, I'm going to show you some etchings that I made uh, at the Shoestring Press in Brooklyn. Um, so after, after my undergrad education, I was working as a social worker with an organization called The Power of Two in Brooklyn. And here, driven by my own experiences of exposure to early adversity, I was working to identify and break patterns of toxic stress that are passed on to younger generations. And it's during this time that I started doing a lot of um, I started featuring a lot of my childhood home and my artwork. Um, so, you know, after my full-time job, I would go to the shoestring press and uh, try to make sense of a lot of complicated feelings that would come up at work. And here again, um, I would kind of like dissect a scene that I was working with into shapes and I would aqua tint it or draw it um, and, and build the image in, in layers. Um, and I would just enhance parts of the architecture that were tied to important memories for me. Um, I, took, I took three months to develop this, this image. Um, then um, this is, I, I did another etching. Um, this one is uh, features a window in my childhood home that I would just stare at uh, often and recreating this image in my new environment through layering drawings and aquatints on copper was uh, felt very calming to me. So this is another uh, etching, but it's, it's more recent. Um, I made this by collaging imagery I had collected from the different places I had lived in last year. It's an etching and then it has a screen print on top and I made an addition of 40 of this particular print and I um, I don't usually addition in large numbers. I made this for a print exchange with my peers uh, at Columbia. And so I titled it, I titled it Wool Gathering. It's a term I've been intrigued by lately. Um, I learned about it late, recently and it means to really like indulge in aimless thought, just how I kind of feel when I'm conditioning in large quantities. Um, so as a printmaker, I really enjoy um, disseminating quick fun ideas. So I started this, I started screen printing tote bags under the name Tote Wali in collaboration with my sister Insia. So Tote Wali in Urdu means um, the lady with the totes. Um, so as part of this uh, collaboration, uh, we select Urdu idioms and I make a literal drawing depicting the idiom. Um, and my sister does the typography for it. So Urdu has these um, figures of speech so that are similar to English. So for instance, in English, if you would say to kill two birds with one stone, for this type of project, I would literally draw like killing two birds with one stone, except I wouldn't use that idiom, but um, that figure of speech, but this, this particular figure of speech, it means, um, it literally translates to showing eyes and it means to give someone a threatening look. Um, so yeah, this project is our lighthearted way to engage our community using the drama and comedy of the Urdu language. Um, 
This particular one, um, it's called Kayali Pulao Pakana. It tr translates to cooking a rice dish in your brain and it means to daydream. This one, um, Dant Khatte Karna, to make teeth sour. Um, it, uh, it means to piss someone off. Um, and then I included a behind the scenes shot for you guys. This is how I make my friends pose for my drawings for this particular project. Um, so um, I was told to talk a little bit about um, my work um, in the pandemic and I've been living in my sister's house in Amherst. Um, I don't have access to a print shop. So when I first came here, I started um, painting on this wall. <laughs> it's still it's still in progress. Um, and I, I really I really miss making prints, but I, I kind of um, figured uh, this way of making uh, these like one sitting drawings on on copper. So I've been um, doing some dry some dry point prints on on copper, and this is like my favorite tool. It's very multi purpose. Um, I'll show you some of those some of those drawings that I'm um, talking about. Oops. Except, wow, PowerPoint is is not working with me right now. Um, <laughs> so can you guys see my screen? I don't know if you're able to. I'm not sharing it right now. Okay. Well, um, yeah, still not sharing it? No. Okay. Well, I've been making some drawings on copper and the way in which I've been um, printing that is by uh, like I've been wiping my copper plates using old receipts and brown paper bags and um, using the rolling pin to kind of like uh, apply pressure to pick up the drawings. Um, and since I can make uh, prints out of them, um, I've uh, been exchanging these in the mail with with friends and as kind of like an extension of this experience, something that I'm working on right now is I, I got a grant to teach an arts workshop um, to high school kids uh, of a charter school in Bed-Stuy. So uh, we're, we'll be making a drawing a day to get, you know, for 42 days. Some of these will be exchanged in the mail. Part of these will be curated um, uh, in, if, uh, for an exhibition in collaboration with the Alpha Arts Alliance. Um, so yeah, these are just some things that um, I'm currently working on. Um, wait, is it working now? Can you guys now see I these? <laughs> okay, so yeah, these are these are some of my homemade etchings. Um, and that's, that's the end of my uh, talk. You guys can ask me any questions now. Um, so one question that I wanted to ask you was um, that I am sure that you noticed uh, that Chitra took the title of the show from the title of your work. Um, yeah. So I wanted to ask you about the meaning of the title and whether you, you know, if you feel that the title kind of has more resonance now, I guess I don't know when exactly you made the work. Um, yeah. Um. I made I made this print in October of 2019, and um, I think when I was when I was thinking about the title, I thought that my work was um, was very was being very safe. Like everything I was creating was too safe, and it was in these boxes or these shapes, and 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 I felt like I. Uh, I was trying to do everything right and when I looked at my print and saw like that little tarp in the air I, I just thought about like wanting more in in general like claiming claiming more room or um, yeah I, I thought about it and then I laughed and then I was like that's what I want to title my print um, yeah I, I actually notice titles um, in artwork all the time it's uh, it's just something exciting I think it it uh, after I finished the print, I gave it that title, my feeling towards the print shifted a little bit where it became from working um, with this like scene that had like very complicated feelings to kind of more organ, more organized in a, in a sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think that, you know, Chitra found that it was a, you know, a phrase that had a a particular meaning but 
you know, at this exact time, it really takes on, you know, yeah. a lot more. Um, so I think that's, you know, that's kind of why she um, went with it. But it's interesting that you found that you kind of, um, like, thought about the work a little differently after titling it that way. I think titling is, is something that's very sort of personal and everyone handles it a, a different way. Um, we have a question. I think you probably um, spoke to this a little bit, but someone is asking, um, you had mentioned that the print of your childhood home, the one where it is looking upwards, took some time to create. What was your process for this piece? Um, this is when this, it was, you know, I was getting into printmaking after, after, after a year, like taking a break for a year. And um, I think I was just teaching myself how to do aquatints. And then um, putting, I, you know, I always work with my reference photographs that I've taken over time. And I was kind of selecting which, what parts of the building to represent. And um, there's always like, I, I, I work to, I work to like capture this feeling that I had when I was like looking up to this building that just kept growing larger and occupying the sky that, you know, like um, this, this feeling of like, um, I think I think this print that she's referencing and and the give me space print are are similar in that way where um, there's like this daunting structure kind of like tape it, taking up more and more room. Um, so I was yeah developing, you know, like thinking about how I want to stage this, and and while also learning about like how to awkward and how you know messing up a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, definitely aquatint is, is a, a labor intensive process. Um, sorry, I'm reading the questions as they come in. Um, someone is asking, is commenting that they love the undulation and the colors of the print that took place in Turkey um, and is asking how you're influenced through your travels of other cultures and countries within your work. Um, when I was in undergrad, I was a social science major and I was uh, I was you know I was doing my field research um, in Hassanki um, and my work my print work was you know a, a like a counterpart to my written uh, written like research so I would feature a lot of things from from my tra like a, you know like scenes from my travels um, I think uh, lately just because through my work um, with other communities I've been um, focusing more inward now um, because that's just what I need to do now but in my past work there has been a lot of um, a lot featured from from traveling and reading about other places mm -hmm. okay well oh, yeah I do have a preference for for ink that transfers well with work. Um, I use like the the Charbonnel inks uh, that etching inks that come in a tube and um, if you're if you're trying to print at home, I've I've tested lots of paper, and I recommend um, like folio paper that's two fifty GSM. You can get that at Blick. <laughs> Good specifics. Um, all right. So thank you so much, Farah. Um, and again, if anybody has questions for Jean Marc or for Farah you know, after they have kind of spin finished speaking, um, we are going to um, see if anybody has questions at the end. So just because we've kind of moved on doesn't mean you can't ask more questions. Um, but at this point, we are going to move on to our last speaker, Erica Shiva, um, and hear about her work. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Hi, so I'm Erica. I um, originally from Hong Kong, born and raised in Hong Kong, and moved to um, New York for my undergrad. And now I'm in Illinois for a three-year MFA program. Um, and I just wanted to start off by saying how humbled I am and excited to be here talking with you guys um, and to be with John Mark and Farah. You guys, I really, it was awesome to hear. Um, what you had to say about your work. So I just wanted to and thank, thank um, IPCNY for having me. Um, so 
Uh, I have a slideshow too. So I have um, the pieces that I have in the show. I have two pieces in the show um, along with some other work, some old, some recent um, that I wanted to share to just kind of talk about my concept and process. Um, so let me just try to screen share real quick. Um, okay. Can you guys see this? Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. So, okay, so this is one of the pieces from the show. Um, and so I just want to kind of start by talking about just the general concept of my work. Um, so at the core, my work kind of exists in this kind of um, constant limbo between logic and fantasy. Um, and I'm especially kind of interested in this tension that is created between these two subjects that I see as like existing as the dichotomies. Um, and so like with this in mind, I've been creating and documenting um, these invented worlds that references mental spaces of my own. Um, and I've been doing this by creating prints and drawings um, um, where I'm sometimes the architect um, of this kind of psychological universe. And by creating these um, prints and drawings, I um, kind of like, like to refer to them as mental scapes or brain maps. Um, so that's kind of something that I've been um, kind of um, working with for the past couple months now. Um, and so other times I also kind of like to consider myself as the author of these documents that um, carry discoveries from this fictional space that I create. Um, and so by considering myself as kind of like an architect and author of this fantastical world, um, it kind of touches on some of the research I've been doing in relation to the ideas of archiving history and what it means to have or be the authority to like publicly disperse information that is claimed to be true. Um, and so for my visual research, I've been looking a lot at like cartography, um, textbook layouts, exploded diagrams, um, and other kind of um, methods of presenting information or findings. Um, so well, yeah, in my work, I like to borrow familiar descriptive languages from these things like textbooks or encyclopedias, um, as well as kind of like formal properties like linear perspective or like zooming in or cropping um, different elements. Um, and this to me embodies the logic that I started off by talking about, um, which I then kind of pair with these uh, fantastical creatures that I create. Um, and I think another reason I've been gravitating towards it is with the hope that by using these kind of familiar visual languages, the viewers um, can kind of revisit their own understandings from their own lives or their own experiences and create their own logic within um, my works. So Another way I like to kind of um, see this distinction between logic and fantasy is through clarity and confusion. And I consider things like uh, feelings and thoughts and emotions to often fit in this category of uh, confusion. Um, and I've been driven by this idea of cataloging and organizing and kind of giving the illusion of analyzing um, these intangible forces that um, you know can't be seen or touched but can only be felt um, and these biomorphic creatures that I've also been uh, creating um, have sort of become like my proxies to navigate these kind of in incorporeal forces um, and they also I see as embodiments of these um, like thoughts and feelings as well um, and by applying kind of like this like scientific or mathematical rigor to these fictional creatures um i kind of want to open up the possibility of like inspection or study to these creatures and blend reality and fantasy in that way um and i've as i've been making my work i've become more interested in I don't think not necessarily criticizing, but kind of exploring 
or observing uh, the abundance of information that we have, you know, like, in, especially in this very digital, um, technical, tech, technologically advanced um, era that we're living in. Um, and just not knowing what is true or, you know, what facts are fiction. Um, and that kind of like this fragile um, nature of our beliefs um, is something that has been kind of a constant back thought uh, throughout my process and practice. Um, so a little bit more about my process. Um, it's important for me, for my body of work to have um, a sort of balance of control and intuition within the process. Um, so by like trusting my intuition, um, and using it to guide these mental uh, spaces that I depict, um, the imagery becomes sort of like a projection of my mind. And I also, um, something I've been thinking about is time and time is often recorded in the pieces I make. Um, they're kind of embedded uh, covertly throughout the pieces. Um, and so this kind of acts as like a personal diary, a visual diary for me. Um, so I've been thinking a little bit more about what that means. Um, um, and in terms of the tension between uh, fantasy and logic that I started off talking about, I also think there's a little bit of a tension in the way that I work um, in that I kind of dis discover these geometric motifs through this um, like process of intuitive form building, which, um, kind of like just flows. I don't, I wish there was like a better way to describe that, but um, for right now, that's kind of how I feel with uh, building th these forms. Um, so then these forms are very like um, pieced together in very like a carefully thought out, like almost diagram diagrammatic manner. Um, and I think my impulse to organize and catalog um, um, reflects my desire to make sense of things for assurance and clarity with, you know, just like how chaotic and crazy and unstable life can get. Um, and so my process, um, I think allows me to enjoy the magic of the impossible, but also all while trying to make um, sense of it all. Um, so this is an apprentice, this is a drawing that I've been doing during quarantine, um, which I will touch on a little bit later. Um, so this is a, a detail of uh, the, one of the prints from the show. Um, and I think the control that I exert in both my etchings and drawings um, is kind of hypnotic and compulsive to me. And this concentration that I vote, devote to both processes kind of allows me to externalize um, my own mental space in a way I do, don't think I would be able to in any other way. Um, and something I've been thinking a lot about is escapism. And I think that has become um, both a part of my content, but also um, my process. Um, and that I'm creating, you know, these kind of architectural brain maps that um, suggest infinity. Um, and I think that lies parallel with the like arduous and time intensive nature of etching that I love very much. Um, and this like control and focus that is required in etching allows me to like really fully immerse myself um, into these worlds that I construct. Um, I'm like literally like, you know, so close up to it. I spend like hours on it. Um, and I think as a result that allows me to foster this relationship between me and this made up world, which kind of grows stronger as um, the longer I spend on a specific piece. Um, and in terms of like some technical stuff, I've been experimenting with spit biting my plates um, to emulate the look of foxing. So like one paper ages and it like deteriorates and um, it leaves some like spots and browning on the surface of the paper. Um, and so I have a little bit of that going on. On You can kind of see, I think, in this image um, in the background. So by doing kind of, kind of like experimenting with techniques like this, I'm starting to consider um, the possibility of my work um, not only being as fine art prints, but also as kind of just objects. Um, 
but so kind of like looking at cartography like considering these as like actual maps um and like the potential of that um and so like by treating the um princess objects i've become more and more immersed um or interested in the materiality of paper and its potential of being folded and torn or collaged or any other methods um, for its kind of original um, form to be manipulated. Um, and so that's something I ha I've been slowly tackling, especially with quarantine. And I think that's one of the great things about prints is that it's not as precious as like a painting. Like you could, I, I have multiples of these where I can experiment with and kind of like tear up or, uh, or like fold and stuff to see what that does. So that's something I've been doing um, from home to just uh, see its potential. Um, so these are kind of close up uh, detail shots of uh, the two prints that I showed previously. Um, and so I just wanted to show this to um, talk a little bit further about my process. So by using the needle tool in etching, um, it allows me to achieve these meticulous lines that I use to kind of like render my forms um, that I create, but also allows me to um, create really fine detail work. Um, so like these clusters of balls that I have going on in this right image. Um, and I think it's something I've tried with other mediums, but I really do think it's the only way I could um, achieve something like this. Um, and um, I like throughout my prints, I like to offer a number of uh, like points of focuses within the tightly packed imagery that I have um, to add this kind of sense of discovery for the viewers, um, but also to um, kind of, um, continue this idea of inspection and analysis um, within the prints. Um, and in terms of the process of etching, I enjoy the small hurdles that arise within the process. So um, most of my prints, I start, I, it's a combination of hard ground etching and aqua tint. I kind of make, make like the skeleton of the imagery with hard ground first. Um, and then do the aqua tint to add some tones and values and then and then it's kind of like a back and forth i go back in with some hard ground to add detail and maybe some aqua tint again to like um, patch up some areas that i missed but um like for example like in the process of hard ground etching like when i'm making the lines like the lines break and i have to go back in with some more hard ground or sharpie or something to fix it up and I, it might not be something that a lot of people enjoy, but like that kind of um, almost annoying part of etching is like something I do enjoy. Um, um, kind of like this back and forth, um, since it kind of makes me feel more in tune um, with the material and the process um, of etching. Um, and um, I've been reflecting a lot about that. And I do think that is like one of the main reasons that I got sucked into printmaking and which kind of um, allowed me to uh, try out different uh, other printmaking forms, like just by being in the studio and seeing other printmaking forms and trying that out. But I think it all stems from etching um, upon reflection. Um, so that I think, yeah, so that's the end of my slideshow. Um, feel free to ask me any questions or, you know, I can go back to any of the images. Um, so I do have a question here for you. Um, okay. Do you represent neurological pathways in these maps? If yes, are they always the same type of shape, icon, or form? Um, kind of, yes. Um, I, maybe like a year or two ago in some of the, I, it's not in the slideshow, but I did kind of work on imagery that um, with um, image, uh, like research I've done on like neurological pathways and stuff. Um, and that I think has stuck. I, there was like a whole series I did with that and I'm kind of like de uh, deviating away from it now, but I think there are some elements that um, remain from those series. Um, I wish I could show those images. <laughs> um, there are a few other questions for you. Um, 
Is your work influenced through music in any way? I ask this because there seems to be an organized rhythm within the first few pieces you showed us. That's really interesting. Um, I don't think so, um, not consciously at least. Um, but um, I've been looking at my prints and drawings and kind of um, analyzing how much of myself is in them, kind of like after the fact. Um, I think uh, whilst I'm making it, it's a very meditative process and it's a very um, indulgent process. So I kind of get, um, I'm at a, like a state where I'm a little bit um, like empty in my mind in a good way. Um, and then so when something's created and by looking at it, I kind of reflect and notice these things from my personal life, kind of like weirdly embedded in the imagery. So that is something I don't think so, but that is something I do want to like reflect on and see if mu the music I listen to is in them. That's interesting. Um, so at one point when you were talking, this might be, not be like a quote, but you had said that the works are sort of like a visual diary. Um, do they start out with um, sort of simpler sketches? Like how does the work kind of evolve into the final piece? Like what is the like preliminary process? Um, so everything starts from a sketch um, um, for kind of like the more architectural uh, drawings or prints I it's a very kind of like step um, it, I start from the left and it kind of like grows to the right it's a very kind of like step of step by step kind of process for me um, but for more of like the document type prints um, I start with a sketch maybe like one on like an um, in half by 11 or something and then I have another sketch that I would like collage onto it and maybe I'll scan it and vi like uh, digitally collage something onto it and then print that out and draw with pencil over it. So like the preliminary um, stage is very time intensive too. So it, it, I do feel like I'm like drafting up a plan, which I then transfer onto copper and, you know, like render, but it's a lot of, um, a lot of collaging, which, I didn't realize that I was collaging until like I kind of really thought about it because um, I don't feel like my um, I'm a collage artist but um, I think there is a lot of something I I like about kind of having something underneath and something o over top and just kind of that kind of also representing a little bit of history. Yeah does the does the aspect of collage ever actually get integrated into the final work or is it just the way that the different like portions of the piece end up in the final composition um for now yeah uh, yeah i totally know what you mean um for now i haven't made any pieces where or prints where because i do want to try the chincole and literally collage um um paper and paper together but i haven't made any pieces um where i've literally collaged um two pieces together um it is something i'm thinking about um but i think i'm a little hesitant because it's hard to addition those i'm a very kind of traditional printmaker that way like i do like to addition my pieces um so but it is something i'm thinking about so yeah most of the collage is in the actual kind of like sketch phase of my work okay yeah um, I think that now would be a good time to kind of have everybody back to do the kind of full Q&A, um, which I think Emma is going to make it so that we will all be on screen. Um, so I'm going to kind of keep an eye on the Q&A, but I also wanted to kind of just start off by asking you guys if you had questions for one another. <laughs> John Mark is like, yes, absolutely. You're muted right now. Hi, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Oh, awesome. Okay, so I have a question for both of you and then sort of like just for everybody, like just if, if, if um, what I'm saying makes sense. I feel like there's something about Erica and, and, and Farah, your work that really has this relationship to time. You know, that building going up in, you say it was Karachi, like, that's amazing. And the, uh, the idea with nine years <laughs> over a span of, I mean, it's just, 
it's it's um um uh, and and Erica like you know that relationship to music you know people are talking about music because it's like it's got obvious uh, you know rhythm and undulation I want to know what you're listening to too but I think that <laughs> what's amazing is that in this uh, this this COVID this is my question I guess this COVID era it feels like you really like found this adaptation like I don't know Erica you said you sound like you were drawing and and, and <laughs> like the rolling pin like home prints I mean that's I'm totally I'm totally like taking notes I I, I love the idea of like, you know transforming your home in, into your studio so I'm wondering does the work is the work influenced by the conditions that we live in or is it is it our outlook on the world that makes us look at the work differently so maybe that's that's the that's the question absolutely i've been thinking um just yeah i mean this whole covid year too and i've been lucky that i can continue half of my practice like half of my practice is drawing so um i do miss print printing a lot and being in the studio a lot um but um drawing has been kind of like this anchor point for me um where um if i'm not drawing i feel kind of out of control, if anything. So it's been very like mentally and emotionally very helpful and soothing for me. And so I'm very lucky in that way. Um, and yeah, I've been thinking about, I think every work that has been created during COVID is political, even yeah. if the content itself isn't right. political. I think Absolutely. any artist making work right now is political. I don't think that is refutable. Um, so that's something I've been thinking about for sure um everyone's conditions are different everyone's feelings towards it is different and that is political i think yeah um with with um my work i'm uh it it, it is very calming to be drawing like it helps with with a lot of anxiety when you can kind of like sit down with just uh, w uh, my copper drawings they're all observational so um like i'm dedicating a specific amount of time to just like sitting to sitting and looking and just like you know kind of um yeah it, it's it's very calming and i also think i'm trying some new things that i wouldn't have otherwise mm. if we weren't in this lockdown for instance like sometimes i'll go for a walk and i'll try to remember s something and draw it on my copper plate mm. um so that's just something i've never done before um and uh yeah, I'm trying to do things that I wouldn't do if we weren't locked into the house. In the house. Uh, can I can I just also mention, you know, Erica? You know, if ever you um, decide to make sculpture, I don't know if you've done any sculpture, <laughs> but like, I, yeah. there's, there's a there's a whole there's a lot there. There's a lot <laughs> there. Yeah, I'm very interested in translating. 2D to mm -hmm. 3D. That's oh, something yeah. I, yeah, um, I'm very drawn to ceramics, but it's mm. ceramics is a whole nother world and it's very, <laughs> I'm just dipping my toes into it, I feel like. So, Maybe now but it is time. something, yeah. <laughs> Maybe now is the time, that's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I see that because you're, you're, the, the prints are very dimensional. You know, yes. you really do mm -hmm. see that, that 3D space um, on the page. I was curious, you were talking about, even before you had mentioned cartography, that one of the prints you showed has kind of like a, like a, a key for almost like it was for scale. Do you, you know what I mean by that? Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you, like when you're making the works, is there something that that like directly translates to? I mean, I know it's some, it would relate to cartography, but I was wondering if you sort of like had like planned through those elements of how it would relate to being an actual map, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, at first, um, I kind of started putting um, references to scale um, just as a reference to cartography. Um, it, it just kind of existed as um, a fantastical measuring tool. It, it, it just kind of existed in this made up world. But I started thinking more about the power of um, symbols and how that could represent something. And so 
for the drawing that I showed, I do have one um, scale in there that actually means something. Um, so with the scale on the top of it, um, I have a letter A with a circle on top and that refers to an angstrom of something, which is um, a unit of measurement used for um, like intermolecular um, and interatomic distances. So like very, very, very like tiny um, distances. And so that's how I picture, that's the scale that I'm picturing these to be existing in like very intermolecular, interatomic like mm -hmm. um, spaces. Um, so it's something I've been a little bit more conscious about, like actually using actual symbols <laughs> that means yeah. something. That's very interesting. It definitely like it, it contextualizes the work in a, in a different way. Like knowing that, I think you have to kind of imagine it a little differently. Or a lot not, differently. not to mention that it looks just like you're scaling up for a monument, you know, like, <laughs> like, you're right. just, like ready to like blow this, this, this thing up. That's, 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 I don't think anyone can look at um, anything that remotely looks cellular without thinking of COVID anymore. True. Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> any, <laughs> any little spiky balls. Oh, we're definitely yeah, it has a whole different context. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right now. Yeah. Um, so we are well, we're technically a little over time, but I'm gonna just kind of follow up with a couple last ones because there are some in the question bar, question box. Um, I think this one was for Erica, but I, Farah, I don't think talked about this either, although Jean-Marc did. Um, what other artists inspire or influence your prints? So I think if Erica and or Farah wanna answer that. Um, yeah. Um. For for me, um, I would say I, I look like for both the va like the visual and and also like um, label you know labeling prints. I really enjoy looking at Didier Williams' work um, and E. J. Hauser. Um, I I really enjoy how they they each play with pattern and also like the text that goes along with their work. It's e e e Hauser with an S or a Z? Uh, H-A-U-S. -E -E mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Mark is taking, taking, taking notes. <laughs> take notes. Um, do you want to speak um, to that? For me, um, one person I could think of off the top of my head is MC Escher. Um, I get a lot of people asking me that too, like if he influ has influenced my works. Um, but is that annoying? I, can I just <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> I feel a little like, conflicted right, by yeah, it because I yeah yeah. But what I do want to say, I think it was last year, so in 2019, in the winter, there was an MC Usher show in Brooklyn, oh, wow. um, a retrospective, I think, um, and it was amazing. It, and I like before, it, like while I was going to the show, I realized that I've never seen an MC Usher print, and and he was a print maker in in museums or anywhere. And I thought that was interesting because they are prints and they have you know, multiples of them, I feel like I would have seen them in my life, but I don't think I've ever seen any until I saw them in person at the show. Um, so yeah, I mean, seeing them in person was amazing. It's like, um, it's like, um, you know, uh, um, he's, 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 a, he's a master. He's like looking at, uh, if anyone's ever seen Norman Rockwell paintings, they look yeah. totally schlocky, you know? But when you see the painting and you see them like, you know, up, up front, you know, next to each other, it uh, changes everything. Yeah, for sure. And just the scale was not some, uh, what I expected. It was a lot smaller ah. than I thought, um, but like so detailed. Um, wow. That actually is a little bit of a segue to a question that I was interested in asking. Someone had asked about, um, Oh, I think this is, maybe I interpreted this question wrong. I think I thought someone was asking how large Jean-Marc's works were. And I think the person was asking how many works were in the series, but I'm gonna stick with my oh. interpretation because- I'll answer both, that's fine. I think they're, online, they're, it's this, something that's funny is you can't tell the scale. So I was yeah, No, the, the series will go as long as there's a supply and the supply is limited to a 
it's a pretty steady production of eight by 10 prints. You know, they don't get any bigger. But like I said, I'm not married to, um, you know, the, 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 the process has its reasoning and its, and its, you know, legitimacy in the medium that it has. Um, but again, if, um, you know, uh, I was thinking about like what's happening, maybe I shouldn't shout this out, but I was thinking about what's happening with all these monuments. Right? They don't pull down this, that guy, you know, and they crumple and they fall down. And we're like, where do they go? You know, there's like in some basement somewhere, you know? Wouldn't it be great to either A, start sending out proposals for new monuments, and I've got, I'm sure everybody's got a list, and B, um, you know, yeah, let's, you know, as, as has happened in history, there was apparently, I, was, I heard on a, a podcast yesterday that there was a ton in France of these monuments that got, <laughs> they got all melted down for the war, <laughs> for the Second World War. They're just like pulling all these things, like, we gotta make bullets, <laughs> you know, quick. <laughs> you know, uh, so in a way, it's like sort of a similar kind of feel. I feel like the era that we live in, it's like there's like deep, deep rooted, um, um, you know, uh, um, um, societal feelings that are erupting, you know? I don't know what that was an answer to. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I sort of veered off. Um, oh, yes, the sizes. So, like, whatever, whatever works. Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, in your, yeah, case, in your case, the, the size of the work by is, 10. is yeah, very yeah. particular because it's, you know, it's kind of what you're, what right. you're working with. That's, that's um, the short answer. <laughs> do... Erica and Farah, do you want to talk about the scale of your works at all? Um, I uh, don't, if I don't have to addition and etching, I, I won't really addition it. <laughs> um, I, mm. I love monotypes because I don't, no one like, you know, I'm not, I don't need to addition monotypes. It's not fun because if you have something already, I, I, I would rather explore something different after that. Um, but um, I, with like sizes, like my favorite monotype size is 22 by 30. What? 22 48. by 30? That's huge. <laughs> that, but that's like how a cat, like, like that's how much like a sheet that like, you know, that's like a very standard sheet size. And like you can, if you find flexi of that size, then you don't have to cut anything. Okay. You're just maxing out the 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 medium, the 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 rollers that you have. I mean, I think that what's amazing, Farah, I should say, is that, I mean, I'm very much in admiration because you have like this whole technique that you describe, which I don't know, you know, a whole lot about printing, but sounds to me very unique, very <laughs> very idiosyncratic what you're doing and this and then back on the plate and then you know this. This like, again, this relationship to time, you know, this like lengthy process, you know, that you go through. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that to me is, um, I, I love, the, I love process. Yeah. The monotypes take a really long time to, to make as well. So mm. um, I think when I'm done with one composition, I'm ready to move on. Mm -hmm. Right. Interesting. Wow. More, more questions. Where is everybody? <laughs> I, so it's, it's 710. Yeah, so I guess we should wrap it up. I think we will be wrapping up uh, unless anybody has kind of one last thing they want to add. Um, Something about Kandinsky. I don't know so what the reference to Kandinsky is. Uh, referencing something earlier. Um, oh, okay. Sorry. I, I talk a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I do think we're going to wrap things up. Right. Thank you, three, for speaking with us so much. And thank you to everyone who Absolutely. is joining us virtually tonight. You know, we want to be able to do as much of the programming as we would normally in the space as possible. Um, so we really appreciate this, um, you guys being here and everyone who asked questions. Um, I would encourage people to, like I said earlier, go to the website. So the link is on your screen now, ipcmyexhibitions.org slash give me space. Or if you just go to our regular website, it's linked. Um, and uh, so if you're interested in learning more about the artists who spoke tonight or any of the artists, when you click on there, 
images on the website. Um, it'll go to a page that shows an artist statement from them. And then it will link, um, for most artists, it'll link to their Instagram and to their website. So I just wanted to say that so that, you know, if people were really interested in hearing about your work, they can um, learn a little bit more. We are planning to do a second round of artist talks on August 4th. Um, so everyone should keep an eye out for that. And, um, you know, keep in touch with us on our various social media.